From Tumwater, Washington, going out to the five counties and beyond, no shits, the TRL podcast. I'm Chris, your perfectly adequate podcast host and sometimes librarian. And if I sound a little bit nervous today, that's because podcasting is one of the many things they don't teach you in library school. And on top of that, we decided to invite two of the most senior folks in the entire organization to sit for an interview. So if I don't do particularly well, this may be the last time you ever hear from me. I wish me luck. And what did we decide to talk about on the first episode of our inaugural podcast series? Well, we decided to talk about one of the most exciting things in the library world today, the history of bookbinding. Just kidding. We're talking about intellectual freedom and censorship. Now, those are two of the most important and topical things in the library world today. If you're plugged into library news, you know that libraries all across the country have seen an increase in book bans, threats of censorship, and even threats to close down libraries because organized groups of citizens decided that they don't like certain things that are on our shelves. So with that, let's get to it. Welcome, Cheryl, Executive Director, and Andrea Heisel, Director of Content and Access. I want to take a second and just have Andrea explain what exactly a Content and Access Director does. Um, thank you. So Content and Access means collections and IT, so I oversee and lead um, both those departments. So the materials that are in our library, whether physical or digital, and then how people access those materials through technology. So very appropriate guest for today's topic. Uh, we're talking about intellectual freedom and censorship. A big topic in the library world today, obviously, we have seen libraries all across the country see an increase in book challenges and attempts to institute arbitrary reading systems um, and things of that nature. But before we really get into all of that, I thought we would widen the lens and first start discussing some of the foundations of libraries and librarianship. I think the two of you would be great to speak to that topic. So for the folks who haven't studied this, who don't have an MLS, who didn't go to school for libraries... What would you say are the foundations of librarianship that are relevant to this discussion? That's a great question. And I think the, the, the core of the foundation is based on the First Amendment. And that protects everyone, every individual's right to access to information, whether that's in a book, on, uh, in a film, an e-book, an uh, audio book. And, and it's for all ages. So that's the First Amendment for all public libraries, for all libraries, actually. That is uh, distilled down to the very core of what we do, is to provide that access for all people without judgment. And to protect, yeah, we, it's, we protect that. We protect your right to access to information. That is the core tenant. It really and is. it's been it's been that way um, for easily over 75 years, if not hundreds of, you know, hundreds of years. Well, since the, since 1776, right? Uh, but the First Amendment is, is the foundation. Part of that access to information is how we, uh, we, we help people find that information if they can't find it, right? And so that looks that could look like the way it's laid out in our libraries. That could look like uh, here's a, a reading list or a watching list or whatever. Um, um, we have staff who are incredibly knowledgeable about uh, different areas of the collection so they could help individuals find that information. Uh, and um, it's... it's uh, and, you know, it's on our website as well. So we have a lot of different ways that our staff can uh, um, help people find that information. We're also, we're also government. And I like to say that we're fun government, uh, but we are government. And in Washington state, we are what's considered a junior taxing district. And so we're not like the senior taxing districts like cities and counties, but we are a junior taxing district. And as such, we are government. And as such, we uphold the First Amendment as a public library. And part of that is going back to what Andrea said, which is we're doing this work without bias in, t in, in the sense of it's, it's not our, our personal opinions, at all. It's like we we know there's 
around 550,000 people who live across the five counties we serve. And so that's Thurston, Lewis, Mason, Grace Harbor, and Pacific counties. And, you know, we know that everybody has different ideas and different opinions about all sorts of different topics. And so what we do as a public library, whether you agree or not, is we have that information to give to you. Uh, and so our collection is what I would call, it's one big collection, and we house it in 29 libraries and on the website through our electronic resources. And um, what's, what's, what's really fascinating and fun to watch is to see how the co collection moves across the five counties because... As you both know, we just did this several years ago where we started to float the whole collection. And so when you go, which means that, as you know, which means that if a person checks out a book in Ocean Park and returns it to Packwood, the book or the item will stay in Packwood. And so it keeps the collections incredibly fresh in our libraries. And at the same time, it gives an insight to what the people in that particular community are interested in reading, watching, or viewing. So if you do walk into your library and you see books or items in your library in Timberland Regional Library that is not of your persuasion, so to speak, um, you'll know that there are other people in your community who are interested in that topic. Yeah, what I find so funny about uh, when people are getting upset about items in the collection is that we're always cycling new things in and out for usually pretty mundane reasons. Yes. In fact, that when you, if you're upset about an item in the library and you think, oh, no one should read this. This, you know, represents a lived experience different than my own, and I wish the library didn't have this. All you really got to do is just wait. So you take that to a city council meeting and you start waving it in the air, and you know picking the most salacious passages and trying to get people riled up about it, that's only going to make it more appealing to people. It's going to show up in the papers. People are going to check it out. And then it's going to look like there are more people interested in that item. So I always found that to be kind of an ironic thing about folks who are trying to ban and challenge things is you're just calling more attention to this. Well, yes. And then it gets checked out more, yes, right? Exactly. Like you were just saying, and people buy it as well. And because they don't want necessarily wait. Uh, but yes, it becomes uh, a hot topic. Yeah, I think you see that sometimes when uh, books are challenged and banned in schools. And so the school doesn't have it anymore. But then this outside organization comes in and says, oh, well, we'll buy a copy for every student in the school so that you can read this book that was, you know, banned by what your local school district. So it only gets at more attention, which I find kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what Cheryl, what you described is the magic of libraries, in my opinion, that um, anybody can find what they're interested in. It's our job to help them find their their question, their information need. And then um, they have a right to privacy about what they look at. And so that's that is the real crux of our service is that we not only do we not make judgment, but we don't release that information to anyone. And we hold that privacy as another core tenet of librarianship. So, Andrea, can you speak a little bit to the history of the Library Bill of Rights and how that applies to our work at TRL? Yes. So a librarian named Forrest Spalding drafted this first in 1938, and it was in response to ongoing censorship challenges to one of our great American um, novelists, John Steinbeck, and his book, The Grapes of Wrath. I know there are uh, seven total in the Library Bill of Rights, right? So without going through all seven of them, what are some of the highlights so the ones related to collections include that uh, we collect materials um, irrespective of the views, origins, or background of, of those who created the, the actual material, that we present all points of view in our collection, regardless of our personal views, um, that libraries should always challenge censorship and the abridgment of the freedom of expression. It's our responsibility. And that a person's right to use the library should not be denied or abridged because of their own origin, age, or background. Um, and then finally, the last one that's most important is also that um, we uh, ensure the right to privacy and confidentiality for people who are using the library so that their records are kept just for themselves and no one else gets to look at those. Our board of trustees has in the past adopted 
the Library Bill of Rights, and we've done that in multiple years. Can you speak a little bit to why we would readopt that uh, multiple times in the past? When you think about the dates um, of when our board ad- readopted and how many times they readopted, right? Um, like the the bill, the freedom to to listen, I think was three times. The Bill of Rights was three times over the course of the last several decades. I mean, Timberland was created by the people for the people in 1968. And so since 1968, to have that many times diff- different boards, um, our boards I'm talking, um, uh, ad- readopt it, to me speaks very strongly of how boards over our past history have felt towards the First Amendment and everything we've just been talking about. Right, that's a good point because you get different members of the board in each era that Correct. it was readopted. Yes. And these are, you know, folks who serve limited terms and cycle in from all parts of the five counties and have different yes. backgrounds and lived experiences of their own. Yes. And it does speak pretty positively to the um, the importance of the Library Bill of Rights and, you know, some of these other statements that they have ad- adopted that multiple people throughout history who have sat on the board have you know, approved this and moved it forward. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense that like, as language changes over time, we would readopt and reaffirm our position on these documents. Yes. Um, so the Library Bill of Rights, last time it was revised was 2019. And then this year, currently, um, we are looking at the, the American Library Association's looking at the freedom to read statement and wondering, um, asking constituents like, should we think about updating the language on this as well? And what kind of revisions are they making? This happens at ALA, is that right? Right, at the ALA level. And, and the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable is a particular group that's looking at these issues um, specifically regarding these core documents. Yeah. And what sorts of language changes are they thinking about uh, making to the Freedom to Read statement? Um, so, you know, we know language changes over time and even what libraries provide over time changes. So, you know, is there language around materials that needs to be updated to our current moment? Um, another thing they're talking about is, you know, does the statement for freedom, the freedom to read statement speak strongly enough about the current political climate we're in and, and the um, challenges that we're seeing. Um, so those are all the things that they're they're talking about and, and thinking about, you know, if, if they're going to pr- propose any changes this year or not. And we had a seat at this table, too, as well, us at Timberland, when the freedom to read statement was being considered for revisions. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So they had a series of online open discussions for um for librarians to come in and talk about, uh, you know, give feedback on, you know, their concerns or questions or thoughts about different topical areas of, when they were talking about what possibly we might want to revise. How the language anything. could look. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And these are important things, obviously, to libraries of all types, to academic libraries, public libraries, school libraries. So I think it kind of applies across the board. Um, and what would you say in terms of you know, working in a public library? Why this is? Um, why would you? Why would you go to your board in the first place and have them adopt this? Why is this so important to public libraries as an institution? It just indicates very clearly that not only this is where we stand, but this is how we support our libraries. Um, this is so important. We believe it's core to library mission. You know, as a board, for them to adopt that. And and again, I'm going to go back to the public library is here for the entire public. And yes, uh, our you know board members represent their counties, and 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 at the same time they're representing the entire district. And as we know, since 1968, our district has grown in terms of population, um, and in terms of all different um, different what's the word you know different people coming in or or being here. And so um, it's it's been. It's been a journey, and uh, and I, I do want to go back to what I just mentioned before because I think it is really important to realize that a, a number of different boards throughout the last 50 years have adopted these three core uh, um, um, rights um, to protect every single person in our five-county region to access to information. Yeah, you're right. The changing demographics of the five counties over the years is definitely relevant. Yes. And we tend to talk about the Library Bill of Rights and our collection development policies as offering something for everyone in the community that speaks to your background 
so that you can see yourself reflected in the library collection, yes. right? But we also, interestingly enough, I like to think, we also have something that would offend everybody. So if we're doing our jobs correctly, there's something on the library shelves for you that you will like and that will speak to your lived experience and also something that you would probably hate and would not want to see in the library, you don't think other people should read. So I think that you know the public means everyone. So we also have something that you would probably really dislike. So. I think that's a, absolutely. We yes. don't tend to we don't tend to frame it like that in the library world. I don't think, but you know, because we try and focus on the positive, we want to frame it in a positive way to you know to every book its reader or whatever yes. the you know the background yes. is. But also like you know, if if you've come to the library and nothing makes you upset, well, we've probably done something wrong there too. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, ideas elicit a response. And so whether that's a good response or a response of outrage or whatever. Or, that's, or neutral. Or, yeah, or, yeah, that was an okay book or that yes. was an okay movie I watched. But, I mean, an idea, that's its whole purpose, right, is to get us thinking about it. And so, again, it's, you know, if you find something that's offensive, um, you know, you get to have that conversation with yourself. Like, what is offensive and why is that offensive to me? And you get to reflect further yourself on that. And people certainly have found things offensive lately. So I think we've seen you know, libraries around the country and in our own backyard have faced an increase in challenges and um, attempts to censor books and remove books from the collection. And there have even been libraries um, locally, too, that have faced threats of closure because we have you know organized groups of people upset that there's stuff in the library that they don't agree with. So you two could probably speak directly to how that has impacted Timberland staff and what kinds of challenges we have seen. Because, of course, we've always seen some level of book challenges in the past. Uh, we have a whole process for that, right, Andrea? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. In the recent past, speak to some of what has happened at Timberland and how we have seen those sorts of challenges. I think we've been kind of insulated uh, from that historically compared to some areas of the country, but we are also seeing that kind of behavior out in our communities and people attempting to get things removed from the library. So just can you give a bird's eye view of what we have seen? Um, well, we know that most of the challenges are around books for that are by or about LGBTQIA folks. And so um, from what I've heard with the Timberland experience is that some of our LGBTQ staff are experiencing uh, more blatant, very clear and verbal, um, you know, confrontations with patrons who are, you know, getting riled up by the rhetoric currently. And, um, you know, that's that's disheartening because, you know, we've talked about library service. We're treating everyone the same. Doesn't matter what your background is. We're trying to fill your information need or find the thing you're interested in and to have people get attacked at work um, verbally about their um, lifestyle or who they are. I mean, it's totally anti-library. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you, the news articles and when this gets written about tends to focus on what the book is that's getting challenged or the folks who are upset about whatever passage in this book or movie or whatever it is they're trying to get banned. But it has a, an impact on the staff who have to deal with that on the front lines who, you know, in almost every case are, they're not even responsible for the review of the items that get challenged or the original collection development, but they, they may be experiencing um, an incredibly negative impact from having to deal with that, you know, on the front lines, on the phone, in the libraries, uh, things like that. And we've had situations where people have come in and called our staff groomers and pedophiles, and we take that very, very seriously. We uh, will take action if there's any kind of disruptive behavior or harassing words towards staff. Staff know that administration has their back in terms of when that kind of situation happens. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, we're here to protect the staff and we're also here to protect the, the public, um, in, in our libraries that is, um, from that kind of disruptive behavior. How many book challenges would you say are, you know, challenges to any material in the library prior to, let's say, like 2020 or so? Like how many do you think we would have gotten per year? 
Um, I had an unusual experience my first year. I feel like we had four or five, yes. which Cheryl had told me at the time was very unusual for us. Yes. So um, they, I feel like we've had more in the past. Um, and mostly what's been happening recently is more of the um, – uh, in the public eye challenge. Right, so not right. a formal challenge where something comes up through the pro appropriate process, but, um, you know, people are taking an opportunity to make a case um, and probably win some people over. Win some political Yeah, points, in a political right. uh, area. So, Well, it's funny you mentioned the, like, the, the process that we have established for you challenging a book in the library or expressing some sort of disapproval over it. Now, we do have a process for that, but it does require you to kind of explain why this item shouldn't be in the collection. So it takes a little bit of time and thought. And I think most people don't want to. Most people who are challenging something in the library or taking issue with it are not really wanting to challenge the thing itself as much as they are to kind of drum up opposition to just the idea of having a certain class of material in the collection. Yeah, what I have found often, and, and when we talk about this with staff and, and do some training around this topic with staff, it's people often come with a challenge from a place of concern and care because um, they want to protect, you know, other people from seeing this or um, what they believe might be misinformation, you know. So, you know, that's the initial response. But when we step back and look at all the facts and we look at, you know, how many places this, you know, has this particular resource and what are the reviews, you know, um, does it fill an information need that's maybe alternative or not popular, um, then oftentimes, you know, it's it's pretty difficult to get something completely removed from our collection. I will well, just yeah. tell you right now. <laughs> the, the, what you're saying here, these are all things that have been considered initially when the item was purchased and added to the collection. You're talking about, you know, does it have cultural relevancy? Is it authentic? Is it timely? Is there a public demand for it? Correct. So this is a, all the same sort of thing that you'd be considering if there were a challenge to an item. So by the time the challenge happens and we go back and we, you know, we assign staff to read that book or to watch that movie. We're kind of kind of just reviewing decisions that have already been made to have added that um, item to the collection. And that's all in the um, very thorough collection development guidelines. Is that Thank not? you. <laughs> Which is available on the website. That is believe. correct. Yes. It is on the website. For the uninitiated uh, casual library fan, what how would you describe our collection development guidelines? Like, what is the purpose of that, and how did that come to be? Um, so that helps the public understand what types of material we buy and why, essentially. Um, and it does, you know, center the Library Bill of Rights and your freedom to read within that um, guideline. Um, it makes it very clear we're going to be buying things that um, not everybody approves of. We'll be buying things about Sasquatch and aliens and things that maybe don't actually have physical proof, but people are pretty sure it's out there, um, for example. So I think sometimes people think libraries only have factual materials, and that is not true <laughs> um, because, again, it's it's an, a place for ideas, right? And so, you know, we can certainly tell you all kinds of ways to be able to evaluate materials that you're looking at, but um, we're not going to tell you that you're wrong for looking at it. Um, so anyway, the guidelines really just talk about, you know, why we buy materials, um, how we buy those materials, what we consider um, what are the priorities and, and things like that. So I like to think there are there are two main types of library people and they're the folks who got into libraries because they like to collect things. They like to collect and classify and keep things. And so, you know, that's what fills the shelves. And then you have people like me who like to get rid of stuff. And that's the other thing that the collection development policy kind of covers is why do we get rid of things? Because we're always routinely getting rid of stuff as well. So, and typically, like I was saying earlier, that's, those are very mundane reasons, you know, something's out of date. Uh, think of, you know, what politician you like or hate from two election cycles ago, people probably aren't checking that out anymore. And we don't have a, you know, an offsite climate controlled facility like an academic library was. So we're not just storing stuff forever. Things are always, you know, coming and going and the collection is very dynamic. So I like to think that it also kind of covers for folks who, you know, don't want to see a certain thing in the library. You know, what, how long is that going to be there in the first place anyway? You know, don't check it out if you're not interested in it. And just wait over time. It's going to probably cycle out like anything else would. So I think that's kind of the other 
really um, appealing thing about a public library as opposed to other library types is the collection is always different, you know, pretty much every 10 years, I would say. Oh, yeah, it's, exactly. It's completely refreshed. Yes, our um, collection development librarians talk about it as it's it's like a river. So it's got to be refreshed with fresh water. Very right? poetic. Yeah, I love that. I love that analogy. It is. A, that's a beautiful analogy. And you probably know this. I was I was a selector back in the day for Timberland, and like that's like two decades ago now. And so, um, I'm sure that the, the items that I selected are probably not in the collection anymore. Um, and so, if we're doing our job right, yes. I think if you're doing your the, if, if if the staff are doing their job right, you know, the large print I purchased, or the fiction I purchased, or the films, the DVDs. At that point, it was VHS and e, uh, audio books. No ebooks at that point. Um, I'm sure it's. They're not in the collection right now. Yeah, and hopefully because it's as high use and <laughs> and it's done its service and it's moved on because we've had to make room for other things. Also to point out that the, the, the national average that public libraries set aside for new material every year is about, what, 10 or 11 percent? And we set aside, is it 16% this year of our overall budget is uh, um, spent on, on new material. And that's a lot. And it's, it's been, it's dipped over the past 10 years a little bit, but we've, we've been able to increase it back up to 16%. And I think, and it, it, so for the majority of the time that Timberland has been around, it has been at 16%. And I think that was done consciously because we are so spread apart, 7,000 square miles. And back in the day, it was basically physical items. Um, and so that translates into a little bit over $4 million a year right now. And so that, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of money. And, uh, and that translates into a, hundreds and hundreds of new items that come in constantly and, uh, and that get turn around, right, within a day. I think another thing that's important to bring up is that um, Cheryl mentioned early on that each of our libraries, like, you know, if someone brings in something on a hold, it stays in that library. So you're, the collections start to take on a little bit of a flavor of that community right, just right. by that. But that one library is not the only library they have access to. And I think a lot of people will walk into our libraries and look at what's on the shelves and be like, well, they don't have anything on X, mm, Y, and yeah. Z. Um, but that's not true. Like we have a catalog that our library staff can help you look through and request things to bring it right to your to your personal library. Yeah, beyond so, that, we yeah. can get pretty much anything from any library across the country, no matter what it is through interlibrary loan. So, I mean, a lot of the uh, library regulars will already be very familiar with interlibrary loan because that's how we get stuff that's been published to, you know, a long time ago that's not on our shelves or that's kind of a niche interests or rather academic. But yeah, that's another beautiful thing that we offer is like, even if your interest is not represented in the library, we can get that item for you from somewhere as long as it's you... Or as long as you're willing to wait a little bit longer, we can probably get it for you. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So we, um, we've we talked a little bit about, you know, book bans and censorship and stuff, but, um, and often, you know, we kind of approach this discussion talking about things that are are, are challenged. We, you know, celebrate Banned Books Week every fall where we highlight books that have been banned and challenged throughout history. And that tends to be where the discussion is centered. But lately, especially at Timberland, what we have seen is folks trying to introduce Things that they claim are not really, oh, this isn't censorship. We're just trying to get you to label books. We're trying to get you to assign categories to them or rate them in some way. And we saw that here um, over the summer in Timberland. And how would you respond to this argument that you know, rating systems are, or they're not censorship. We just want to give uh, people more tools to evaluate what it is that they're checking out or what their children are checking out. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because I know we've seen that directly. Yeah. So what's interesting about that is one of the ideas that came forward was the movies, the MPAA rating. And, and, um, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand that that's a copyrighted, trademarked rating system, system or yeah. a rating that if we did adopt the MPAA rating, um, that we would probably be sued and That's lose. an industry rating system, that too. That is the, an industry the, rating. And, you know, the publishers have said the same thing in terms of it's just too burdensome to come up with something like that. A lot of the books that do come in that we get are already, they already have some kind of notation on them. And Andrea could speak uh, uh, about that. Um, yeah, it's... Um, 
you know, we say that our libraries are already set up in a way that is for very young children and then older children, then teens, young adults, and then for adults. So we're already, we're already, we already have a system. And we also, we are not like, the, like the schools are in locus parentis, right? Which means that the schools act as the parent when the parent is not there. For libraries, we are not, public libraries are not schools, and so, uh, or public schools. And so um, that means that we are not going to act like the parent. We encourage the parent or guardian to read to their children, to, to work with, to talk to their children about what they, you know, what their interests are and so on, and make those decisions for their children. And, and, and also not to have one parent tell another parent outside that family unit um, to, to, you know, this is what you should be reading to your child. You know, at Timberly, we provide all sorts of different tools for people to determine the content of the book that they're checking out or whether it's suitable for their child or for their family member. And you speak to that a little bit and just tell us what some of those tools are. Yeah. So um, even inside of our library catalog, we have, um, you know, as Cheryl said, we we designate the area of the collection this material needs to go in, but oftentimes the actual item record itself will say it's for kids from four to eight years old suggested, you know, like, so publishers are providing that information a lot of times, whether actually on the book already or um, inside of that cataloged record, we've included that into the, the record for everyone to look at. Um, a lot of our uh, library catalog includes reviews not only reviews from outside entities like Kirkus and Library Journal and School Library Journal, but also from community members. So um, we have more of a social media aspect to this new catalog that we've recently migrated to. So if you're interested in a Goodreads type of review, which is also a good review site, um, then you can see that within our catalog if people have submitted um, a review on a particular book they liked or didn't like. And um, I always find it fun to go in and look at especially controversial books and see where people like <laughs> hand on things. It's always enlightening. Um, but the amount of resources we have just around reader's advisory and is this book good for you, um, just embedded in our catalog, it totally takes care of a need to do any further additional um, labeling or any other work around that, in my opinion. And it's, yeah, that's very true. And we also have the option for folks who don't want to do that research themselves, we have a form online you can fill out. You can get personalized recommendations. Just tell us what you're looking for, what you like, what you don't like. And there are librarians who are far more skilled than I who can take that recommendation and find a whole selection of different items that would meet your specific needs. And we don't judge what those needs are. If you tell me, you know, you want a, a book for your um, 10th grader and he likes, you know, dragons, but you don't want any romance. I'm say 10th grader, but that's probably, let's, let's say middle school. You're probably, probably not into dragons, no romance in 10th grade. Don't, don't take my word for this, but <laughs> no matter what it is, we can find, um, we can find something for you. Not we, including me, cause I'm terrible at this, but, uh, there are very knowledgeable librarians all throughout the system who yeah. can handle that, what we call reader's advisory. So recommending things to people based on what it is that they, they want to read. Yes. Yeah, I always say our library staff is the best resource. So you, you're you having trouble finding something that you want to read or you don't want to take a lot of time to try to figure this out in our catalog, just go to staff and say, I'm looking for this type of material. Um, can you help me find it? We also have access because we purchase access to other um, review resources like Novelist. Um, we have Novelist for K through 8 and we have Novelist Plus for adults. So um Again, just additional resources for parents to make decisions, informed so, decisions on. Yeah, just jumping in with and, uh, to what Andrew just said, Novel is, is an online resource, and it's for adults, and it's for K through 8, and it's an incredible, uh, there's two separate ones, because for the ages, um, and uh, they're really great because they offer reading lists there, like you were saying, but also like award-winning, uh, different kinds of awards. And it, there, it's just a really great online resource to learn more about areas in literature that you're unfamiliar with. Yeah, so online resource in this case meaning basically a subscription database that we subscribe to yes. on behalf of our patrons. Yes. And we can help you learn how to use that as well. So if you're not familiar with Novelist as a resource or Goodreads for that matter, or if you want um, a different a different slant, there's... Um, 
there are websites that librarians are familiar with that can show you how to find you know, the most diver diverse books for kids, for example. Or if you are just into science fiction and you really want to dig into science fiction recommendations, there are you know, resources for that as well. And depending on who you talk to, and we'll refer you to the most knowledgeable librarian for your topic, there's a whole world of of resources out there that you can use to be your own best reader's advisor if there are specific interests um, that you have or things that you you don't want to have included in your in your reading selection so and we have staff you know this we have staff who have a very specific interest in very specific genres and they are like the expert to go to for xyz and and we all know who they are and uh, and it, and it's very helpful like you were saying andrea a very talented staff who really know their books all right we covered a lot of ground here today and we are just about out of time so i'd like to wrap it up cheryl any final comments what i would like to say is um yes we've had recommendations coming forward um from some members of the public. And then we've also had members of the public, as you know, the July 2023 board meeting where we had 142 public comments, the most, nice. I believe, in our entire history. I watched that one. It yes. was very, very inspiring. I actually had to count them for over two weeks because we have to be very specific. I mean, we have to like record how, how, many, how many public records we get, right? I mean, public comments we get. And um, that's the most we've ever received ever. And what I do want to say is that um, as this administration, including myself, we would uh, stay the course with where we're at, with the uh, multiple times adopted Library Bill of Rights, the freedom to read, the freedom to view, and, uh, and keep, the, keep steering the course of this ship as we have been steering it since 1968. Yeah, that's a very good point because any sort of additional rating system on top of what we already do would actually run counter to things that the board has also adopted in the past, Correct. like the Library Co Bill of Rights. Yes. So those two things would be potentially in conflict, even if it made it as far as a, you know, a board policy. Right. Right. Good point. Yes. And my parting comment would be that I think one thing people don't realize is that um, we get requests to remove things from any political spectrum side, right? Yes. And so regardless of that, taking into account our collection guidelines, um, you know, I protect the right for anyone to have access to information. It doesn't matter what your political ideology is or your religious ideology is or if you're not religious. Um, so I think that's a key point to make and to keep in mind that this protects everybody and their right to freedom of speech and freedom of access information. Very well said. I think that's a great note to go out on. I appreciate both of you being here today. Thank you. Thank you. 